Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the Parramatta River Catchment Group's Riverfest webinar, Swimming in the Parramatta River. My name's Nell Graham and I'm the coordinator of the Parramatta River Catchment Group. We are an alliance of Parramatta River Catchment Councils, state agencies, or state government agencies and the community working together to make the Parramatta River swimmable again by 2025. Today we're putting the spotlight on some of our Parramatta River proposed swim sites uh, that are actually being developed now. We're going to talk to three council officers about the proposed swim sites in their local government area and also Sydney Water about the water monitoring uh, program that they're running. I'll introduce each speaker in turn as we progress through each swim site. But I'd also like to introduce uh, Jasmine Paget, our PRCG Riverkeeper, and Nadia Young, our Communications Officer, will, who will keep an eye on the Q&A and respond to your questions as we go. Uh, so please, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A. Um, oh, whoops. Got to remember to go forward. <laughs> we'll type them into the Q&A and we'll respond as we go and actually answer some of the questions after each presenter. So you can um, ask during the pre presentation and we'll get to it at the end of each speaker. Um, so yeah, please remember to do that. Uh, I'll also... Um, switch between our uh, presentation and uh, the people who are presenting as well. But firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of our land and water and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So this is the Parramatta River catchment. It encompasses 11 local government areas. The catchment covers an area of 266 square kilometres from Blacktown Creek in the west to Cockatoo Island in the east. The river is around 19 kilometres long with 14 main tributaries and many more creeks and channels crisscrossing the catchment. Our vision and mission to make the Parramatta River swimmable was developed in 2014. This led to the development of the Parramatta River Catchment um, Master Plan, which outlines the 10 steps to make the Parramatta River swimmable by 2025. Ensuring that water quality is good for swimming will also lead to having a healthy living river for all. The Parramatta River Master Plan identified potential swim sites for activation. So to increase the number of swim sites along the Parramatta River. Currently, there are four swim sites where you can swim. And they are at Lake Parramatta, Chiswick Baths, Cabarita Beach and Dawn Fraser Pool. But this evening, we're gonna find out about new sites that are in progress and then uh, and that will be completed soon. We'll also learn about the science that has gone into understanding whether the sites are suitable for swimming and there will be opportunity, of course, for you to ask questions in the Q&A chat box. So firstly, we're going to uh, put the spotlight on Hunters Hill, our newest proposed swim site at Bedlam Bay. And I'd like to introduce Joe Taranto from Hunters Hill Council, who will tell you all about it. So welcome, Joe. Hi, Nell, thanks so much for having me. Uh, yeah, we're, um, we're pretty excited to be part of this uh, and pretty excited to have our own uh, potential swim site in the Hunters Hill Council area. So um, I'm excited to tell you all about Bedlam Bay. I'm gonna be showing some photos, I believe, now. Yep. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. That's right. So can you give us a bit of a, a history about the site? Yeah, um, like a lot of our foreshore areas, um, it's got a pretty extensive 
um, pre-colonial uh, history, which um, it's a Wallamugal land, part of the uh, Darug Nation, which is um, a snapper fish uh, country. So we um, obviously have had very strong populations of uh, snapper in that area. Um, Post-colonial uh, times, um, it was a convict um, a precinct. Um, so there's probably some pretty, um, at times, troubling history at the site. Um, and then it's been a, um, also the site, um, a part of the Gladesville Hospital precinct. So again, on top of that, much like Callum Park on the other side of the river, it's got a pretty strong, um, you know, asylum and health um, precinct history as well. So um, it's, it's a pretty colourful and at times uh, painful history of this site, um, but it is a place that's pretty hard to beat when it comes to the beauty and just the natural um, cove that's formed there. So I guess that's why it lends itself to becoming a swim site. And it was a swim site um, and it was quite well developed I mean, about 1866 and um, was actually called um, the bathing beach. And it, it's pretty much, um, you know, the place that's perfect for just wandering and having a, a little paddle. I've just gone forward so we can actually see the bathing beach. <laughs> <laughs> so what and do you I see? Think, uh, Sorry. No, I said, I said everyone who's been there says, wow, this is exactly what it is. It does look like a bathing beach. So. Yeah, it's it's really beautiful. So, um, what are what are you uh, going to do to activate this site? What yeah, you... well, it's it, it it's it's um it's a shame, I guess, in a way that a lot of the site and the the activation that was there before, I uh, was dismantled um, in the fifties when they built a proper pool at the top of the hospital. So, um, they no longer, I guess, were swimming at that point, um, as we know the river was. Um, you know, less lending itself to swimming at that point. So um, what's already there is some natural steps, the sandstone steps. Um, it's not a site that we're going to be able to make easily accessible in terms of, um, you know, wheelchair activation, but certainly um, at the moment, it's got some really lovely steps down to the area. Um, and um, we will be looking at um, some sort of netting and some cleaning up the site. Um, but really because of the way the site is, design and because of all the beautiful pathways and access points already there. Um, the beauty of this site is we don't have to do too much in a physical sense. So that's another reason why it lends itself to being a great swim site. What do you see the benefits to the community of opening up this swim site? Yeah, well, I guess the Hunters Hill, um, they're, I guess, often describe themselves as tiny but mighty. Um, they're a small council area compared to some of the other sites in the catchment group. Um, but the thing um, that Hunters Hill residents love is the fact that, you know, they have waterfront almost completely around the council area. Um, and a lot of residents really want to use that water. Um, they want to be able to paddle, they want to be able to swim. Um, like so many of us, they don't want to have to travel to the other side of the city to, to have a paddle. So we already have people utilising um, the Woolwich Baths on the other side on the Lane Cove River. Um, so this would just be a really nice complement to providing recreational space um, on the Parramatta River. Lovely. So um, what do you think the time frame is for this? Um, when will it be open for swimming? Yeah, so um, we're starting our, as Daniel I think will talk um, to shortly, um, the process of activating, I guess from a council side of things, a swim site is quite extensive. Uh, we probably go above and beyond what most people would expect, um, but that's great. So we're starting our, um, our risk assessments and, and testing uh, this swim site, uh, this swim season, so that we can look at opening next, next year for next swim season. So we need uh, 12 months worth of good data. Um, and um, yeah, we really hope that come the end of next year, we'll all be in there having a swim. <laughs> Lovely. Will there be other um, facilities available there? Yeah, so the thing we love about this site is that we're looking at activating the whole precinct. So we've got some really beautiful um, activities planned for the Bedlam Bay um, sort of natural amphitheatre. 
um, including um, you know, outdoor cinemas and um, a lot of events there. It's a really stunning site. It's quite hard to believe that we, it's you know, not utilized more. So um, there's already some beautiful toilets, some of the nicest loos in Hunters Hill there, um, and great footpaths. There's a community garden, there's launch um, sites for boats already. So really all we need is um, some shark netting and the go go ahead and and we're good to go in 2020 2021 no, 2021. that's great that's awesome yeah i um i've actually been down there and it is a beautiful spot so i'm really looking forward to being able to swim there um we've got a few questions here so yeah. um jasmine are there questions ah here we go uh, so, uh, does Bedlam Bay uh, site have a sandy bottom free from oysters, etc.? Yeah, um, there are oysters at that site, um, and we know oysters are a good thing, but yes, not for feet. Um, so, um, some of the uh, areas uh, we don't want to disturb too much on some of the sides, but um, there are certainly um, things that we need to do to make sure it's safe for people to walk, walk in. So. Um, some of the oysters that what we've looked at so far are just sort of, you know, loose and um, will be able to sort of be moved across. Um, but, you know, if one of the things that we have to be cautious of and careful of with our community members is explaining that there are oysters around at times, um, you know, one of the precautions might be that we just inform our um, residents of that. So, um, but yeah, there certainly is um, oysters that have formed naturally on those sites. Great. Uh, and is there, uh, you talked about shark, shark netting, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's, one, that's certainly something that the community, um, I think at all our swim sites, wants that peace of mind. Um, so we're working closely looking at what Canada Bay are doing with their shark netting as well. Um, and that will be um, definitely part of the activation. I think the community would expect that. And to be honest, that's what used to be there as well. Uh, is there much parking or public transport access to that site? Yeah, um, the good thing about the Gladesville Hospital precinct is that it's on Victoria Road, so access is fantastic. There is lots of parking, but the hard part about it is it's really hard to find your way in. And like so many of those sites, it's a bit of a convoluted kind of space and it can be a little bit hard to find the magic. So I think a lot of it will be talking about wayfinding and making sure that people know where to go and, and how to get in. But there's plenty of space and, and plenty of access points. And uh, ha, uh, the final question is, have you looked at Clark's Point, Hunter's Hill as a potential site? Or any other places, actually, in Hunters yeah. Hill. Yeah, yeah. Look, Clark's Point's a little trickier, I will admit, because um, that's right on the harbour. Um, got a lot of boat traffic through there, and um, as we probably could talk about another time, um, the further we get in there, there's some. I think it's a little bit trickier in terms of, um, you know, water quality and a few things. But um, Clark's Point's certainly very heavily used by, um, you know, sailing and and other boating and recreational places. Um, and the other sites that's previously been um, indicated um, is the Henley um, Baths. Um, so, you know, there's nothing to say that we couldn't activate that as well. That's just around the corner, a uh, very similar water quality um, situation. But um, I guess in terms of the overall precinct um, at the moment, and, and what we will be doing is getting some feedback from the community as well as we go along, but certainly, because this site's going to be used a lot more at Bedlam Bay um, in general, the whole Gladesville Hospital, that this really makes sense that um, this is available for swimming as well. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, so we'll move right along now uh, to the next site. We're going upriver to Putney Park. Unfortunately, um, Kylie is unwell and wasn't able to come today. So I'm just going to briefly talk about this site. Um, if you have any questions about it, put them in the Q&A and we'll have to get back to you with, with answers because, um, because Kylie was unable to come. So uh, there's going to be a new sea wall here at, um, at 
to be constructed at Putney Park to enable the activation of this foreshore site and provide accessibility to the um, to the sand um, as is as depicted in that in this picture. Um, the council has proposed the construction of steps to enhance the amenity of the park and provide new recreation opportunities. Uh, the proposed steps will be approximately 10 to 15 metres long and centrally located along the foreshore area nearest to the, the playground area to provide access to the beach. The design will also aim to provide a connection to the beach area through seating and steps while providing future ecological benefits through its design um, and uh, within the tidal zone of the river. The upgrade for, this, upgrade for the site will provide an opportunity for the community to access and explore the foreshore uh, and interact with the beach. At this stage of the project, Council is only providing access to the foreshore and, and not a, a swim site. I think that will be phase two. So Council uh, will also look at connections to the surrounding area and will review shading opportunities to expand on uh, tree planting in the area. So that's that for Putney Park. I can see there's no questions. So we'll go across the river to uh, Bayview Park in Concord and I'll introduce Daniel Wood, the civil engineer, um, environmental engineer from City of Canada Bay, who will tell us about the proposed swim site at Bayview Park in Concord. So welcome, Daniel. Thanks, Nell. Thanks for inviting me along today. It's all right. So I'll, I'll just go through a bit of the history of um, Bayview Park. So Bayview Park is situated at the end of Burwood Road in Concord um, in Hen and Chicken Bay. It's a pretty popular park at the moment. It currently has a playground, toilets, picnic facilities and a boat ramp. The park has been a popular swimming site in the past with evidence of a swim site from at least the 1930s. And the last swim enclosure was constructed in the 1950s but by the light, late 1960s, the swim site was closed due to pollution concerns and the enclosure sat derelict for many years until it was removed in 1995. So our plan to activate the site here is, is to reintroduce a swimming area, um, a new netted swimming enclosure like, the, um, like the, the photo you can see in the presentation. Cool. So... Um... How long has Canada Bay been a member of the PRCG, um, Daniel? Yeah, so Canada Bay first got involved in the PRCG back when it started in 2007. So we've been along for the ride since, since its inception. Um, we have over 35 kilometres of um, foreshore in our local government area on the Parramatta River. So we're committed to help improve the health of the river and to increase the water recreation opportunities that are available to the community as part of that. Right, oh, maybe I'll go on to the next slide so we can see another view of the um, looking back from the wharf. <laughs> so how long does it take to get a swim site like Bayview Park, um, you know, up and running from concept design to completion? So it has been a bit of a long process to get to this stage. Uh, there's many issues we need to be considered to, to successfully deliver a project such as this. So. The Parramatta River is actually managed by New South Wales Roads and Maritime Services, so we need we need to consult with them on the proposal before we can commence work, and we require permission to construct and license to occupiers from RMS for us to us to actually uh, to build this enclosure. As it's also next to a ferry wharf, as you can see there, we've also had to liaise with them around uh, future maintenance of the wharf and having access, as well as um, boats and ferries to be able to to access the wharf um, safely with the swimming net in place. So that's, but there's been a fair bit of discussion around that. And as, as you, everyone can aware, there are significant water quality issues in the past around the area. Bayview Park was an area with heavy industrial around it. So there is a lot of concerns about 
the safety and the quality of the water. We have been doing quality testing and uh, Daniel Bradley from Sydney Water will discuss that a bit further on. Um, being so close to residents as well, we've also had to consult with, with our community to make sure that any proposal we have um, doesn't impact them on them too much. And we take in, in, into consideration any issues they may have as part of the design process. As well as that, there's statutory planning requirements such as DAs and those sort of things we need to, to go through to get final approval. And the park is also a heritage item as well. So we need to take that into consideration when we're doing our designs to ensure that we're not impacting on the, the heritage um, of the park. So all up, for, it'll be around two years from the initial discussions and concepts to actually getting, getting the um, enclosure constructed. So when um, do you think that this website will be open then, Daniel? So we're, ho we're hoping to, to get it finished and completed sort of um, April next year, April 2021. We're hoping we'll have it, have it up and running. Well, that's exciting. I can't wait to take a dip there. It'll be lovely. Are there, um, Jasmine, are there any questions for Daniel at this point before we move on? Uh, no, uh, hang on. Uh, and I think um, uh, the site has been regularly used by rowing clubs that use the beach on regatta days. What are they going to do now when regattas are held there? So as part of our consultation, we've reached out to the to the rowing clubs. Um, they did have some concerns about about the uh, the site, um, as you can see in the pro in the in the um, picture, we've, we've left a, sp a gap there on the beach where, where people can um, access the beach in and out through, through, through the gap there. Um, it also is a, on a recognised uh, rowing route as well. So we're, we're, um, we're um, mindful that we need to ensure that the design, the final design of the enclosure, um, there's no safety issues in terms of, of rowing rowing vessels uh, colliding with the, with the enclosure and things like that. Is there much parking at the park uh, or public transport access? So there is, uh, there is parking at the park. Um, being near local uh, residential area with uh, recently developed, there is uh, a lot of demand for parking in the area. Uh, it's also a very popular spot on the weekend, and so it does attract a lot of people to the park to have barbecues, picnics, and those sort of things. Um, so we are looking at, at options to help with the, the traffic issues. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, opportunity to, to put more parking in the park without um, impacting on the amenity of the park. So we are restricted in, in that in terms of how much extra parking we can, we can provide. Um, but there is a bus route that runs to the park, directly to the park as well, so we encourage um, public transport to access the park. We also have cycle links to the park, as well as um, improving our, our, our pedestrian links. There is a ferry wharf there, but the ferries uh, were discontinued at Bayview Park a few years ago, so we'll continue to try and lobby for the return of that ferry service as well to, as another access way to, to access the park. I have a question. Uh, oh, sorry. I was going to say, will there be lifeguards at this swim site? Uh, so we're not planning to, to have permanent lifeguards there at this stage. Um, we're looking to manage it like many other um, swimming enclosures like this where they are unattended, but we'll, we'll provide um, signage and uh, safety equipment, so life buoys and those sort of things if we need to. We can always review how, how busy it gets and there, will, there is always the, the option of um, employing lifeguards on busy days. Um, to if, if we need it in the future. All right, um, just one there more There is question. another question yep. about parking. Uh, so the extra cars, what uh, will council do about dealing with the extra cars and the need for parking, presumably outside the park? So um, like any other, other busy sort of area, there's only so much parking we can provide. Um, we, there is, um, there is street parking nearby, so um, we, there is no, as I said before, there's no real opportunity to, to add parking to the park. Um, 
so people just need to, to park nearby just like any other other busy site like Bondo Beach or anything else if, if it's busy and expect to not park right in front of the beach that's all that's all we can do well we can always promote the public transport <laughs> to the park as well <laughs> yes yeah all uh, right will there be oh, oh there's a couple of more questions but oh can we, we save time? them till the end and we'll just move on sure. to McElwain um so also Daniel is looking after McElwain Park can you give us a bit of uh, background to this one yeah McElwain Park is located on uh, Braze Bay and it was a park that was constructed in the 1980s it's currently again it's another popular destination with families and the current facilities there include playground toilets picnic facilities and barbecues uh, the plan is for theirs to increase the opportunities for the community to interact with the river. So it's not going to necessarily be a, uh, a swim site like Baby Park where we've got a shark net, but it'll provide opportunities for people to launch kayaks and canoes and, um, and things like that. So the works uh, will include replacement of the current seal, the new um, ecologically friendly um, sandstone wall. And that, that wall will incorporate a series of natural rock pools to provide natural habit, habitat to the marine life. We're also providing a new beach area, um, which will be constructed so the community can enjoy the space to relax and enjoy the Parramatta River. Uh, the new accessible picnic and barbecue facilities are also being installed, as well as let more native landscaping trees and salt marsh planting that will help restore the foreshore to its uh, natural state. Great. So the the key difference between the two sites is what one's a swim site at Bayview and McElwain isn't really appropriate for swimming. So correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. So, so Bayview has a nice sandy beach and um, there, a nice slope into into the into the sand into the water, so there we can build a nice enclosure. Whereas at uh, McElwain, it's a bit more of a, of a drop. Um, there's a sea seawall all the way around. It's quite a, a muddy bottom more than a sandy bottom, so it's not a it's not as um, inviting to go swim there. So we've looked at the best ways to activate that, and, and that's to, to provide more of a, a splash type experience. Um, being able to explore the rock pools and, and the foreshore and being able to, to launch um, kayaks and craft and explore the river that way. Okay. Um, do we have questions for this site, Jasmine? Yes. Will dogs be allowed at either of these sites? So um, McElwain Park does have a section of the park which is an off-leash area. So, so dogs currently are allowed at that site. Um, they won't necessarily be allowed along the beach area or the or the new rock pool area. Um, they're only allowed off leash in those in those um, designated off leash area, um, but they can be on lead in in other areas. Uh, at Bayview Park, they won't not be allowed to have dogs on the beach section, so that will be a dog free zone. Um, but there's no no reason why dogs can't be on leash in the park area behind. Great. Will there be any platoons or platforms to swim to within the enclosure at Bayview? So no, at this stage, there's no plans to install pontoons or, or any platforms within the enclosure. It's, it'll just be entrance off the beach with a with a net suspended by pylons around around the side. Great. Uh, and there is a question about barbecues and other picnic facilities. Uh, I imagine there's there's some at Bayview already, but uh, are you adding those? So at Bayview, there's some already some barbecue and picnic facilities. So at this, we're not looking to add additional there. Um, at McElwain Park, there's some already some barbecues and picnic facilities, but we are adding some more some more in that location as well. I should play this fly through while we listen, so we can really get a good picture of what it might look like. Uh, there's a question about the length of the enclosure at Bayview. Yes, yeah, so I think the current concept plan shows it at, at around um, 50 metres, 50 metres long. 
I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. And will the toilets be upgraded on either side? So not at this stage, not at this stage of the project. Um, the budget and the scope doesn't allow for major upgrades of the facilities, but uh, that that might be something that was looked at in the future based on, on the demand for one, once the site opens up. I think that uh, river activation project uh, fly through really does give a good picture of um, what, what this site's going to look like. And um, it looks like it's got a lot of good environmental features and little nooks and crannies uh, for um, marine life. So uh, that looks great. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, yes, there's a question about swimming lanes at Bayview. Uh, would, oh. would that be possible? Look, I don't think we're looking at that type of thing at this stage. Um, could be something we look at at the future, but um, it's not something that we're looking at at the moment. Yep, fair enough. All right, well, thanks, Daniel. Hang around. There might be more questions that come in. Um, and now we're going to move on to Daniel Bradley from Sydney Water. Uh, Daniel is um, uh, the Sydney Water Water Monitoring uh, Program person. And I'm going to actually stop sharing so Daniel can share his screen. So it might take me a while. <laughs> That's all right. We've got plenty of time, I think. <laughs> we without uh, <laughs> Kylie, we've. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Nell. Um, so, I am the River Watch coordinator, or the water person is okay. <laughs> the water there. person. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, as we've already heard. Uh, some of these sites were used for swimming and recreation many years ago and haven't formally been uh, since. And so it's really exciting to be a part of this and to be able to hopefully provide this amenity to the community um, in the future once again. Um, so what I want to talk about today is the steps that are taken toward act activation, in including how we select the site, uh, the assessments that we undertake in order to activate a site and why we undertake those assessments. And then following that, how we provide the community with the information that you need to decide whether you uh, want to swim at a particular site and when you would like to swim there or when it is safe to do so. So <clears throat> uh, the first step to site activation is to identify your potential site. Um, and to do that, we use a swim site activation framework. And what that essentially is, is a document that outlines all of the things that we should be considering uh, before we activate a site. And some of those things we've already heard about are uh, in some cases a bit easier to do earlier on in the process, uh, such as assessing access and parking and uh, boat traffic and ferries and those sorts of things that are already there and quite visible um, that will help us prioritise those sites. Some of the other assessments that we undertake, such as the water quality and the sediment testing that we do, require a bit more of an in-depth detailed assessment and aren't as clear, the outcomes aren't as clear until we've undertaken those assessments. So ideally, uh, a site would fit favourably into the three categories you can see here of feasibility, desirability and vulnerability, and that will give us our highest potential swim sites to, to activate. Um, so the reason that we undertake this water quality and sediment testing is because the Parramatta River is a highly urbanised and densely populated catchment, and there are many sources of potential pollution into the waterway. Uh, so this is a conceptual model that we developed for the Parramatta River. It's available at the link that you can see at the top there. 
Um, so, and I know it's a bit hard to read. So if you did want to view it and read it in more detail, you can just go to that link. I'll just briefly go through some of these. Uh, so number one on here is the uh, historic industrial land use and some of the waste management management practices that we used resulting in um, chemical contaminants in the sediment in the river. We also have sources of microbial pollution and a few common sources of those could be uh, blockages in our wastewater networks, such as tree roots, wet wipes, things that we try and keep out of the uh, network but sometimes can't. Uh, can cause wastewater overflows and they, they don't always, but they can reach waterways and be a potential source of pollution at our sites. There's also more common things such as animal feces and that could be your pets or all the wildlife in parks, bushlands and reserves or um, things such as build up of litter and chemicals in drains and uh, stormwater when it's dry. So th this conceptual model here is a dry weather scenario and is a sort of stable baseline level of water quality at the site. So there is some inflow uh, and background of, uh, background flow from stormwater canals and creeks that uh, can impact on pollution at the sites, but it's, it's quite minimal. Um, our main source of pollution is during wet weather when that animal feces and the buildup of uh, road grime and litter in the drains and so forth get washed into the waterways and ultimately to these recreational sites in a relatively short period of time. And it takes a little while after rain for that to dissipate and then to reach those dry weather baseline conditions again. Um, and that's primarily why we don't recommend swimming during rainfall or for a short period thereafter. <laughs> uh, so they're the potential sources of pollution, but to understand them a little bit better, um, we undertake a number of assessments. So Sydney Water runs the River Watch monitoring program, and that's in place to assess the water quality. And what we do is test the water and assess the results against the National Health and Medical Research Council guidelines. And they are a standard set of guidelines that are used throughout Australia for assessing water quality and managing risks in um, recreational water. And we test the water on a weekly basis throughout the swimming season and monthly throughout winter. And what we've been monitoring uh, some of these planned sites now for more than 12 months. And what we're finding is that uh, the water quality fits within those guidelines during those dry weather periods. And when water quality falls outside of those guidelines, it's generally during those wet weather events and the, the short period thereafter that I, that I mentioned before. And this is similar to, uh, similar to other sites that are already active on the river that like Mel, Nell mentioned before, uh, Cabarita Chiswick and Dawn Fraser. Um, the water of course is not the only thing that we need to consider on the Parramatta River. As I mentioned, it does have that industrial history um, with those poor waste management practices and land modification that have left the legacy of heavy metal and dioxin contamination at some locations along the river. Um, so to properly assess this, uh, we had independent experts develop a framework by which to assess the risks to human health from those types of contaminants. And what the uh, foreshore councils are now doing is engaging those independent experts to collect sediment samples at their respective sites and analyze and assess those risks against that framework so that we can properly understand what that means for risks to human health. Um, <clears throat> the, the final assessment that we undertake or that, that councils undertake uh, is a general site risks. And this occurs after all the infrastructure is complete, everything's built, uh, the nets are all in and this is just to ensure that everything's safe uh, for the community to use and they would include those sorts of assessments like we already heard about with the oysters on the beach or submerged objects um, and whether lifeguards would be required or not. So whilst we undertake all these assessments, how does that help you know if you should or shouldn't use 
your favorite swim site or a potentially new swim site on any given day. Um, <clears throat> whilst we test on a weekly basis, the lab results generally take a couple of days to come back. So we could just give you the water quality results that we previously took that week. However, that's not going to tell you if in two days time, your favorite site's going to be okay to attend and the water quality will be fine. Um, as I mentioned, the water quality is dynamic and it changes with that wet weather. Um, so what we're doing at Sydney Water in collaboration with uh, researchers at the University of New South Wales is developing a predictive model that allows us to take all of that historical data that we've collected and predict uh, to a certain degree what the water quality be will like water quality will be like over the next few days. So this means on a <clears throat> hot Friday afternoon, you're ready ready for the weekend, you want to go to your favorite swim site in the summer, you can appropriately plan uh, your trip to the beach. And the way we're communicating this is through an interactive map on the Isle of River website. And it will have information on the weather, including the three day forecast, uh, tides and the, and the water quality or, and the microbial risks there. Um, <clears throat> if you wanted to find out some more information about Riverwatch or the current and planned sites that we have, you can visit the Isle of River website. Uh, there's a whole range of information in there, including more detail on our microbial monitoring and chemical assessment programs. Uh, or alternatively, you could email us at riverwatch at sydneywater.com.au. We'd be happy to get back to you with um, any answers to the questions you might have. And I think that's me. Do you want me to stop sharing now? I'll stop sharing. Yeah, that'd be good. Because then we can see everybody and we can open it up for more questions. Um, so, oh, um, I don't know which one's will, okay, uh, so. <laughs> will there be any specific warning signs or beacons when the contamination levels are too high, say after rain? Uh, there won't be any specific warning signs at the site. However, through that interactive map, it will uh, note, it, there will be a notification that the water quality is uh, high risk, high moderate or low risk, depending on what the water quality results or predicted water quality results are. And uh, what, will the chemical assessments be monitored regularly going forward, like weekly microbial testing, or is it just a one-off test before the site is opened? At the moment, it's just a one-off test before the site is opened. And we know that heavy metals and dioxins are present in the sediment. Uh, what we don't yet know is what the risk is of the concentrations that are present uh, to human health. So <clears throat> it, if we identify chemicals that are legacy chemicals and a lot, a lot of those legacy chemicals aren't continually, they're banned and they're not continually being added into the river, uh, it, the one-off assessment will be fine. If we find uh, chemicals that are an issue that are still discharged or, or present in stormwater and that sort of runoff, then we, we could potentially move to monitoring on a more regular basis. It would unlikely be weekly, however, I, I couldn't uh -huh. see the question was, um, and it sort of also included about microbial testing. So that would be uh, not a legacy. Uh, yeah, microbial testing will continue on a weekly basis throughout swim season and monthly throughout the winter. Thank you. Mm. Oh, uh, I, I was going to ask, would it uh, sediment testing, um, would you need to do it annually to see if anything's changed or that's uh, not required? At the, at the moment, it is just a one-off assessment, but it will depend on what the outcome of the initial assessment is, as that will inform us more as to whether we need to continue and monitor or just the one the one time. Okay, sorry, Jasmine. Uh, can you tell us about the trends in water quality over the past few years? When did it start to get better? Uh, we've been monitoring at these sites since July 2019, 
And the, the trends in the water quality data we have just show that um, the sites are safe to swim at in dry weather. And in those wet weather events, the uh, microbial com contamination is greater. The, I think that improvement over time is more related to the, the chemicals in the sediment, which we don't have a full assessment and outcome of yet. Okay. Any more questions? I think, I think there are. Um. I saw something in the chat about, will you be able to put up uh, notice boards um, at each site where to check where to check water quality before swimming. I think um, absolutely that's something that um, we'll be looking at. We'd love to have some whiz bang interactive signage there that um, you know takes you to a website or a QR code that gives you a reading or something, I don't know. But uh, there will be interpretive signage and there will be definitely uh, some information about where you can find out about water quality. The plan at the moment is to use a QR code on the signage at sites to direct people to the interactive map That's and right. the water quality information. Great. Um, I put a link to where, uh, where uh, things you can do uh, on the website and then where can I swim on the Parramatta River, which will, it has the interactive uh, map and then some information further around River Watch. Okay. Is there any other questions? I think one's just come through. Oh, here's one from Kelly. Given that all new swimming sites will have a shark net, are there plans, oops, Oh, I've lost that one. Are there plans to put one in at Cabarita? I think that's a question for Daniel Wood. Yeah, thanks, Nell. Look, uh, that's something definitely we're, we're looking to do in the future. Uh, we haven't got a, a budget uh, allocated for it at this stage, but it's something that's been discussed and uh Certainly in the future, it's something we'll, we'll look at it's doing once um, baby's been, been done. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, sorry, it just pops up. Will litter booms go into the swimming sites? Uh, I don't know who can answer that question. Daniel or either Daniel. <laughs> I don't think um, litter booms... Uh, would be needed unless there's a stormwater um, outlet uh, co close to the swimming site. And I don't think, Daniel Wood, is there at Bayview any stormwater outlets close to the swim site? Look, at Bayview, we don't have any major stormwater outlets uh, there. Um, so I don't think that's, that'll be a major, major issue at that site in terms of stormwater pollution. Um, after, after, after rain, I think it's more more to do with the the, the sewage uh, issues after rain, which uh, Daniel was talking about. Mm. Also, I know at Putney Park we did a site assessment, and there's no stormwater outlet there either. So, um, and uh, Joe, do you know whether Bedlam Bay? I I don't believe there's a stormwater outlet. No, it's, it's surprising because you do see areas of the river um, in the mangroves particularly looking, you know, less than mm. sparkling at times. Um, what surprised me about um, Bedlam Bay and that little um, area is how pristine it did look at, on the few visits I've been. Uh, so we'll keep monitoring it. I know that, um, you know, it really depends on the weather and how much rain you've had and also... Um, you know, different events, but um, it's certainly not an area that seems to attract quite as much um, litter there. So that's that's doesn't mean it's not there. I guess it's just um, we're just quite lucky in that sense at the moment. Cool, thank you. Um, oh, a couple more uh, questions have come in. Uh, when will recreation fishing be safe in the river, and will it be allowed in the new swim sites? Ooh, well. Uh, recreational swimming, uh, sorry, fishing is uh, is is uh, 
kind of a state government um, th thing, the fisheries <clears throat> look at that. And um, do you want to answer that, Daniel? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I'm no expert on, yeah. on chemicals and chemistry, but the, there's a big difference between recreation in the water of the, at a swim site and uh, fishing and eating fish out of the river because of things like bioaccumulation and those sorts of things. So uh, dermal contact or contact with your skin and the, and the sediment uh, is the main exposure pathway of the chemicals to your cells. However, if you're eating fish, you're ingesting it. Uh, not as safe. So I, I couldn't comment on when recre or if or when recreational fishing would be allowed at the sites or at these sections of the river, but it's not something we're assessing as part of this. No. I believe recreational fishing is allowed. Um, it's just the advice oh, is not yeah. to eat anything yeah. west of the Harbour Bridge. So there's yeah. nothing, there's no rule saying you can't fish, but the advice is from um, yeah, just not, to not eat. eat anything west of the group. So, thanks, both Daniels. <laughs> and there's a few more questions popped up. I can see. Uh, there's a, a question about. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The person who's put this question: as long as the beaches can be still ex accessed from the river, with enough room for sailing boats and kayaks to land. Uh, so I guess it's a comment. Uh, basically, that person would like to have make sure that there's enough room for sailing boats and kayaks to land, presumably at park um, uh, any time or high tide. Uh, uh, Is that in relation to a specific location? No. Oh, okay. uh, unless the person will uh, add that in. But I would say if they were talking about Bayview Park, that there would be, there would be enough room for kayaks to land uh, outside the uh, shark enclosure. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so there is. A, a few, I don't know if you can go back to to the uh, image of of the proposed site, but there is there is a gap between the wharf and the proposed net. So there's areas to access there. Um, there's also other areas on the other side of the wharf as well where you can Oops, access the beach. So. Yeah, that's it there. That's it. So it's a spot, and and further further past on the other side of the wharf, there's a bit of sandy beach, oh. and there's also a boat ramp area as well where there's some sandy beach next to the boat ramp. So there's multiple areas where you can access the, the foreshore from the river um, at Bayview Park. Okay. Great. Um. Does that conclude all the questions? Uh, there's a comment regarding um, litter at Cabarita and that uh, one of our participants gets feedback from people that there is litter there. So mm. what can be done about it? Is that for you, Daniel, Cabarita? Uh Look, a litter, litter throughout the uh, the catchment is is always going to be an ongoing issue. Um, I think Cabarita's uh, on more of an open stretch of the river as well, so it might be more prone to, to picking up and collecting litter on the beach. So it's something um, if we start, if we're going to activate Cabarita a bit more than what we need, we can look at that. But um, we do have some GPTs in the area already to, to help collect uh, that litter before it goes in the water, but it's it's hard to to collect everything. Yeah, um, often it's coming in with the tide from somewhere else, so that is an issue. Um, also, uh, you know, maritime does collect litter on a regular basis from the water, with their boats coming down uh, to Duck Duck River um, daily, daily to collect. Uh, litter. Unfortunately, it's, we need to convince people not to litter in the first place. Um, but uh, we're looking at developing um, a whole of catchment uh, community uh, litter strategy uh, for the Parramatta River catchment. So hopefully this will address some of the litter issues that we can um, identify them and highlight um, 
what they are, where they are, and how we can get strategies to address them. So that is a plan. We have applied for a grant and we're waiting um, to get confirmation on that. Um, is that the end of the questions? I, I think, think it so. is. All right. Well, so thank you everyone for joining us this evening for our Swimming in Parramatta River webinar and also for your great questions. Um, really quite a lot of questions, which we really appreciate. Um, we're excited to be um, getting these new swim sites up and running and next year will be a big year for um, for opening a couple of swim sites, I believe, or the site activation at McElwain at, and Putney Park at the, at the end of the year. So if you uh, want to find out more about our Riverfest events, you can go to the Our Living River website. Um, but we have one more exciting uh, webinar scheduled uh, tomorrow. So if you want to come along at lunchtime tomorrow, Wednesday, and um, look at the Eagle Cam that's um, near uh, Sydney Olympic Park and talk to uh, Judy, or hear from Judy Harrington about uh, the uh, sea eagles that live there and the two fledglings that they've had recently. And there's still one um, young, eagle in the nest so it'll be exciting to uh, learn about that tomorrow at 12 30. so if you haven't already booked in book in it'll be great so th that's it for us this evening from the Parramatta River catchment group and and partners I'd like to thank Daniel Bradley from Sydney Water Joe Taranto from Hunters Hill Council Daniel Wood from City of Canada Bay um, and also Jasmine so thank you for your time tonight and for informing us about the swim sites in your local government area. Um, and thank you all for your time and enjoy the rest of your evening. So good night from us. <laughs> <laughs>